everyone, and welcome back to the live stream ministry of Temple Free Will Baptist Church, where the sun is always shining. We had a wonderful time in the Lord this morning, and tonight I'm thankful for my dear friend Dennis Swanberg, who graciously is allowing us to rebroadcast this comedy concert he recorded for David Jeremiah. The Bible said that a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. So I'm not going to take up a lot of time tonight. Uh, but I just want to thank you once again for all that you're doing. Uh, for your support and your participation and, and for tuning in to uh, our live stream. I'm going to pray and then we're all going to be blessed by America's Minister of Encouragement, uh, Dennis Swanberg. Pray with me. Father, we are so thankful this evening for this and other privilege to call on your name. And we thank you, dear God, for this good day uh, that you've blessed us with, a time to gather together and worship and sing and pray uh, for, one, for one another and to hear from your word. We thank you, O oh God for all that you did for us this morning during this service. And, and we thank you, Lord, for the encouragement that we're going to receive uh, this evening from your servant and from my friend, uh, Dennis Swanberg. And so we pray that you'd meet with us, that you'd move in our midst, and that you'd minister unto us. And for all that's accomplished, we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thanks once again for tuning in, and we hope that you enjoy Dennis Swanberg. Well, it is an honor to be with you, and uh, I just want to tell you, I love life. I, I love life. Do you, do you love life? I mean, have you, have you thought about it lately? Do you love it? Now, I know that we've got our bumps in the road. Hello? I've got two boys. Chad, is, uh, Chad just got married in uh, January and married a beautiful little girl, Lindsay. And we're so excited. He, he, he was 29 years old and finally, <laughs> finally found a woman that looked at him as a stranger and took him in. <laughs> we thank God for Lindsay. We love Lindsay. She's a, she's a physical therapist. Thank you, Lord. Because <laughs> cause Chad has a uh, degree in accounting. He has an MBA. He's brilliant like his mother. The, his college wanted him to be a uh, actuary, uh, whatever that is. Uh, it's something you do in a cubicle. And, uh, <laughs> and our CPA, I mean, the, the guy with numbers is awesome. And so what is he doing? He's an athletic director and head football coach. <laughs> I said, son, you're not going to make any money as a coach. He said, Dad, I don't care about the money. I don't care about the money. I said, well, one day your mama's going to die. <laughs> and uh, when your mama dies, there ain't no more money, son. <laughs> your stimulus package is gone, 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 you know. But he ain't worried because my little wife, Laurie, my little honey love, my sugar babe, my woman, four foot eleven going to heaven. She's so fit. She ain't going to die until she's 98. And, uh. I'll press on and head on earlier. I mean, but I, when I die, she will cry for about two weeks. And when she realizes how I've left her financially, uh, then she'll say, whew, I think I'll go on a cruise with, with Charles Stanley and David Jeremiah in the same year. <laughs> so. But I'm, last thing I said at their wedding, I did their wedding, I said, last thing I said was go and multiply. <laughs> I did, I said that. Because see, they're these young couples, they get this, he said, they said, we're going to wait six years. I said, oh no, we're not either. <laughs> I want some grandbabies, good night, I, we ain't waiting, let's go. I said, you know, while your mama's writing the checks, she'll buy the clothes for the baby. She'll babysit the baby. Let's bring the baby on. Don't worry about the finances. 
I'm afraid by the time I get a grandson, I'll be in the third stage of the assisted care living center. <laughs> They'll bring him in going, Dad, here's your grandson. And I'll go, ah, ah. <laughs> Only thing me and the baby will have in common is we both need to be changed, you know? <laughs> Yeah, my wife said, I think it'll be cute. You'll both have your pull-ups. Okay, thank you. Thanks, thanks. <laughs> and I, my youngest boy, Dusty, he's, uh, he wants to do what I do. He's ADD and everything. And, and he's good. He's funny. He's a good speaker and everything. And he's in seminary and doing all that stuff. Bless his heart. Whew, having to go through all that. And, you know, I, I pray for him in the ministry but I did 22 years in the local church and then I left the pastor back in 95 to do this full time free at last free at last thank God I'm free at last <laughs> that's one reason I love life but anyhow I, <laughs> but I do love life you know we ought to love life come on people we gotta we ought to enjoy life and I enjoy life I enjoy my family uh, I mean, we have our challenges, we've had our heartaches, we've had our tears and all that kind of stuff, but I love life. I love it. I enjoy life. I really do. I enjoy my family. I love my, uh, my, my family of faith. I love, I love my church family. Uh, we have a great church back home, and it just, we just, I love my church. I, I only get to be there about six times a year, but we send our tithe in regularly, and my pastor said, I don't care if you come or not, just send in the tithe. I mean... <laughs> How sensitive was that? But, uh, but uh, we love our church and so excited about our church. Our church is one of the fastest growing churches in Louisiana. And I, I get my little uh, thing on my little iPhone. You know how they do that? They send you a little report. The newsletter's on the iPhone now. I can do that. I can read it and everything, know what's going on in the prayer list. And I'm so, so excited about our church and everything. I love our church. Only thing that sort of irritates me when I am back there is when we do the praise music, we're in a praise service, the one we go to, you know, and I'm 58 years old, and, you know, we're in there praising the Lord. They stand for 40 minutes. <laughs> Can't you praise the Lord sitting down? I mean, pray about it. I mean, they, I, mean, I, mean I don't mind it, but they go on and on and on. But anyhow, but we have those PowerPoints like y'all have right there, see? Right up there. Wait a second. I don't know if we want to talk about that PowerPoint anymore. Uh, <laughs> get a little thin up there. But w we had those PowerPoints, and our music guy, he's good. I mean, he's good. And y'all's music, y'all are good. But one thing I told him, I said, listen, I, I like PowerPoints because it has the words up there. But when you got a waterfall behind it, I cannot focus on both. <laughs> Either the words or the waterfall. <laughs> I just thought I'd throw that in there. But anyhow. I love our church, and we love our pastor. We just, we just gave our pastor a whole month off, you know, five weeks. And, and when, you know what, when we did that, you know what the staff said? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> but he came back today, so tomorrow's going to be tough. You know what I mean? But we love our pastor and gave him five Sundays off and just take off and just get recouped and everything. And, you know, I know you love your pastor. And, and right now, if you love Dr. David Jeremiah, let me hear it from you. <laughs> And if, you, and if you love his wife, Donna, give me a shout-out for his wife. Woo, girl. Let me tell you something. I don't know what y'all do for your pastor and staff for Pastor Appreciation Month. But I want to give you an idea. This is the greatest invention in my lifetime. Have y'all ever given him the George Foreman Grill? Y'all know what I'm talking about? The George Foreman Grill. I love that George Foreman Grill. How many have one? Raise your hand. Quite several of you. There's always a remnant. Some of y'all don't know about it. The George Foreman Grill, where you 
lift the lid up, put your hamburger patties in there, and you close the lid, and, and as you cook the, the, the burgers, all the grease goes down into a tray. There's a tray that catches every drop of grease, just goes down into that tray. You, have you seen it? Every bit of grease goes into that tray. Then you take your bread and you daub it in there. You don't lose one drop of grease, people, I'm telling you. The greatest invention in my lifetime. And if he doesn't have one, y'all ought to get him one. It's the greatest invention in my lifetime. Now, my greatest, my favorite boxer in my lifetime is Muhammad Ali. I watched the, the Friday night, the Gillette Friday night fights when I was growing up with my daddy, Floyd Leon. We'd watch boxing, a little box. I just looked. I love action, a little bit. Because I've watched, you know, I was boxing all my life. I, I, I majored in Greek and religion at Baylor University. I got a master's degree at Southwestern Seminary, Fort Worth, Texas. I got, a, I got a doctor's degree. And I don't know how to say this. Please don't misunderstand me, but I love violence. <laughs> We're not to be given to violence. Not to be given, given to it. No. But I left. <laughs> but as a pastor, you can't pop a deacon. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you, you, you can't pop a deacon. You, ben, you can't take an usher and just whop, whop, whop. You can't do that. <laughs> but I love, I just, I love action. I've just always loved action. And then, so I'd watch boxing. And so... Ali has just always been Muhammad. I mean, he's the man. I mean, that's the last, to me, the last boxer. I mean, I, I had, you know, who's on the scene? I don't even know who they are, but Muhammad was just unbelievable. I was on the plane with Muhammad Ali in 2000. We were flying out of South Bend, Indiana, going to Cincinnati. I was sitting up in first class because I'm upgradable and biodegradable. <laughs> and I fly all the time, so I get bumped up. You know, I'm, I'm you know, they move me up. And so I'm up there, and it's 5.40 in the morning. I'm tired. I'm weary. I'm sitting there. My eyes are closed, and people are getting on the plane. Finally, they let one last person get on the plane. This person grabs my knee. I look up. It was Muhammad Ali, and I lost it. I went, Muhammad, <laughs> Muhammad. And he looks at me. He goes, I'm sitting over here, <laughs> Muhammad Ali. I mean, I, I moved the seat belts for him so that he could get situated because he has that Parkinson's disease and everything, and I helped him get buckled up. And I said, Muhammad, I said, I've been imitating you all my life. You and Howard Cosell, y'all are my heroes. And, and, and he said, he said, let me see you do Howard. Right there, first class, on the plane. <laughs> and people are around us sort of looking like, what's going on up there? Well, I don't care what they think. This is my opportunity. God's opened up this door for me. <laughs> and so... I mean, right then, I went into Howard Cosell. Went, no doubt about it. Let me tell you, Muhammad, no doubt about it. You've known the thrill of victory, the a a agony of defeat. You've known Joe Frazier, Jolton Joe Frazier. He comes at you. He works the body, but you work with him, and you've been great competitors all these years. Muhammad, what about smoking Joe Joe Frazier? I'm titled Joe Frazier. I want Frazier. I want to whoop him. I'm going to get him. I'm going to nail him. I'm going to put the whoop on him. I want you. I'm the greatest. I can dance like a butterfly. I can sting like a bee. I want victory. My name's Muhammad Ali. I mean, I did that for Muhammad Ali. Right on the plane. And, and he leaned over to me, and he said, you're good. You're good. Well, if they say you're good, you don't stop. <laughs> I went right into Ross Perot. Y'all remember Ross Perot? I said, listen, I said, Muhammad, I saw that fight between Tyson and Holyfield, and Tyson had bit off part of Holyfield's air. I called up Holyfield. I said, Holyfield, this is Ross Perot. I'm all ears. I'll give you part of my ear. 
And Muhammad leaned over and said, he didn't, did he? He didn't, did he? I said, I just made that up. He said, you're good. You're good. Well, I just kept on going. I mean, I did Ronald Reagan. Uh, yes, no, well, maybe. Uh, uh, Muhammad, Nancy, and I have watched you uh, uh, many times. Uh, box uh, on television. And, well, uh, yes, uh, no. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I did my Bill Clinton. I went, I feel your pain. <laughs> I mean, you are a great boxer. I mean, I have watched you all my life. <laughs> I probably should not say this, but let me just say this this way, okay? <laughs> if I had met Sarah Palin in college, I'd be a Republican today. <laughs> Now, if you're a Democrat, lighten up, you won. But, uh, <laughs> but anyhow, man, I was just on a roll. I mean, I, I did Forrest Gump. You were my hero. I would never, ever box you. If I did, I'd feel like I'd been bit in the buttocks, you know. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say about that, you know. And I did Barney Fife and said, oh, you're, you're the man. Oh, gosh, you're, you're unbelievable. Now, this body is a lethal weapon. <laughs> I mean, Mayberry is the gateway to crime. I mean, I was, I, was, I was on a roll. And there were people, of course, around me going, who is up there? Who's the nut? You know, well, hey, I'm, this is my opportunity. I'll never sit with them again. You know, I'm, I just went on and on. I did... I even did old Slim Pickens. I went, I'm telling you one thing, Muhammad, you know how to do the rope a dope and everything, and you're tough. You know, I mean, I did, I did Mr. Haney on Green Acres. Now listen up and listen good. You are one awesome boxer in our country. I, if I could be your Pete. Or, man, I know I could take you around the world, you know. <laughs> oh. Hey, now, now these younger people and college students and, and young singles and young marrieds, they're going, I don't know, I, I don't know who he's doing. I don't know these people. <laughs> well, watch the History Channel, honey. Watch the History Channel. <laughs> and if you want to inherit Grandma and Grandpa's money, like what we like. Okay, good. <laughs> so, I mean, I was on a roll with him. And uh, then I thought, you know, I need to get a witness in, you know. And uh, he's a Muslim. I'm a Christian. I want to share my faith with him. He may want to share his faith with me, but I want to share my faith with him. So I was thinking about how to do it, and I thought about a little popcorn testimony. So I said, Muhammad, uh, this is the way I went about it. Uh, I said, Muhammad, I was in Billy Graham's office uh, just a few weeks before that. Uh, doing stuff for Dr. Graham. You know, I've done belly for belly. <laughs> I mean, when I go to churches, you know, I'll, I'll do my Billy Graham on many occasions. And like when I'm here at your church, I love doing Billy Graham. I've, I've loved David Jeremiah a long, long time. Great Bible teacher. <laughs> here at the Shadow Mountain. All these mountains all around. If I was pastor here, I'd put barbed wire all around and so you can't get out until you start tithing or something like that. I don't know what I'd do. I, do. I love doing Billy Graham, but anyhow, so I thought I'd been in his office and he had Muhammad Ali's picture on his credenza. Credenza. You know what a credenza is? I know what it is. Now, we never had one when I was growing up. We never had a credenza. We had a little TV tray <laughs> with a breeze detergent towel slung over it. Remember, y'all remember Dolly Parton used to advertise? Y'all remember that? I remember. I was about 14. I remember real well. <laughs> I 
I thought surely there was a beach towel in there, but anyhow, that's just <laughs> what I thought. You'll get it later on. You, it'll hit you. So, but I said, Muhammad, he has your picture on his credenza. And he said, I met him in 1979. And he, he had gone to Asheville, North Carolina, to Black Mountain to meet with Billy Graham back in 79 about their, their illnesses and stuff like that. And they're friends. They're good friends. And, and so I said, well, he loves you. And so many people in our world love you, and I love you. And then I said, more than anything, the Lord loves you. That's what I said in that little one. I said, the Lord loves you. That's my little popcorn testimony. The Lord loves you. And he was gracious to let me say that. And, and then he said this to me. He said, he said, he said, let me hear you do Billy. I said, well, I don't like to do Billy Graham 30,000 feet up. We were that high up. I get nervous doing Billy Graham that high up. <laughs> okay, I'm going to do Billy Graham. Now, I didn't have time to go back to the coach section. And this was before 9-11. I didn't have time to go back to the coach section to warn them that I'm going to do Billy Graham. Didn't have time. And I can't do Billy Graham quietly. So right there for Muhammad, I broke into Billy Graham and I said, And I want you to know, Muhammad, I remember in 1964 when you fought Sonny Liston. And in the latter rounds, Sonny didn't come out of his corner. And it was controversial. And you were victorious. But there was a lot of controversy that went on and on and on and on and on and on and on. <laughs> But then a year later, you fought him again. And this time, you defeated him in less than two minutes in 1965. And, and the picture of you standing over him will be in my mind a long, long time, maybe forever and ever and ever. I love to say ever. <laughs> and we have literature for you. And when I did that, three people came walking down the aisle on the floor. <laughs> They came forward. And usually, you feel, when I got saved, you filled a card out and give it back. Well, I didn't have a card to give these people, so I just pulled out that pukey bag and said, here, fill this thing out as best you can. I said, by, give it to Delta, and by Thursday, there'll be a Baptist knocking on your door, I promise. <laughs> oh, you know, I tell my boys all the time, uh, those were the days. Uh, you know, all these voices that I do from sort of way back there, I just can't help it. I, I just have this sense and this feeling that those, those were the days. I loved, I, I loved life. I, I loved life in those days, and I love life in these days. But I do have to confess that sometimes I think those days were the best. I just think they were awesome days. Uh, I was part of the... I was part of that television generation. I love Lucy. Andy Griffith Show. Oh, Barney Fife, whatever you're doing right now, just nip it in the bud. You know, I mean. And then Green Acres is the place to be. Farm living is a life for But anyhow. And, and those Billy Graham crusades, I love to think back to those crusades when he would preach. At the end of a crusade, he'd look into the camera and say, some of you are watching tonight by way of television. Maybe you're at your home or maybe you're sitting at a bar. And I want you to write me. Billy Graham, Minneapolis, Minnesota, or Winnipeg, Manitoba, or Oki One Kenobi. Just write me, Billy Graham. <laughs> I love Dr. Graham. I love going and doing stuff for Dr. Graham. I've been with him on times of eating supper with him, and I said, Dr. Graham, I hope you don't mind me imitating you tonight in front of everybody and your family and staff at the Cove. And he leaned over and said, You could take over. When you're ADD, you take things literally, and I'm going. <laughs> I thought, what's Franklin going to do? You know, I just. <laughs> had to make a job for him. But anyhow, uh, and then I remember later, another time, we were out there on the porch sitting in those rockers, 
And they had these rockers all over the cove on porches, and we're sitting there, and I said, Dr. Graham, these are nice rockers. That's the only thing that came to my mind at the time, trying to think of something to say. I said, these are nice rockers. And, and Dr. Graham said, it was my idea to put rockers all over the cove. People like to rock and spend time together. So we put rockers on every porch. Ruth and I had rockers at our home at Montreat, and friends would come over, and we'd rock together. And I don't know why I said this, but it just came right out of my mouth. I, I said, Cracker Barrel has some nice rockers. <laughs> have, ha, have you ever felt like an idiot, you know? <laughs> but he's so gracious. You know what he said? He said, there's too many people at Cracker Barrel. I went, That's a problem they're having right now. But... Uh, so anyhow, I, those, those were the days, and I just think those days were just sort of awesome days, you know, and my boys hear about it all the time. They get so tired of it. Baseball, I love baseball. I was raised a Yankee in Austin, Texas. We got some Yankees out here. I watched the Yankees in Austin, Texas. We had one channel, KTBC. Uh, that we had one channel, and we got the Yankees. So because we got the Yankees, I was a Yankee fan. So just bear with me here for a minute. Moose Scourin on first base. Bobby Richardson on second base. I love Bobby Richardson. He's in Sumter, South Carolina. He's a friend of mine. Bobby was the MVP of the 1960 World Series. Remember that? You know, and on the losing team because Mazeroski hit that home run and just ruined everything. But 1961 came back and we won that one. And, and oh, that was a biggie. You know, uh, Bobby Richardson played about 11 years, and nine of those 11 years went to the World Series. Can you imagine? And won four of them. What a year. You know. And then, of course, you got Quebec at short and Cletus Boyer at third, Whitey Ford pitching, Yogi Berra catching. And don't you love Yogi? And Yogi's Yogi-isms. Like when you come to a fork in the road, take it. And Bobby stays up with Yogi and keeps up with him, and they see each other often. And I was asking a while back, I said, now, how's he doing? He said, well, he's done them, those Affleck commercials. And, uh, and, and, and he, he said, I was talking to him the other day about it, and Yogi said, hey, Bobby, he said, you know those Affleck commercials? They cue those ducks with a little flashlight, pin flashlight, and when they cue them to you know, turn their head or open their beak, they do it with a pin flashlight, Daniel, a little pin flashlight. And, and Bobby said, that's awesome, Yogi. And then Yogi said, you know what, Bobby? And Bobby said, what, Yogi? He said, they don't really talk. <laughs> Is he a great American or what? <laughs> and then, of course, you had Roger Maris and, and Mickey Mantle in the outfield. And when Roger Maris hit 61 home runs, that was huge. It was huge. It was just huge. I remember as a young boy, seven, eight years old, I guess I was, when he hit that home run and broke Babe Ruth's record. My daddy, Floyd Leon, took me aside, my daddy, six foot two, 220 in his prime, squatted down, looked at me eyeball to eyeball, and he said, you'll never see that record broken in my lifetime or your lifetime, son. Say it to me. I went, I'll never see that record broken in my lifetime or your life. That's history, son. That's what they ought to be teaching in your school. <laughs> Say it to me, son. That's history, Dave. It's what they ought to be teaching in the school. And don't you forget it as long as you have breath in your body. Say it to me, son. <laughs> I'll never forget it as long as I have breath in my body. 1998, on September the 8th, on a Tuesday night, some of y'all know where I'm going with this. I was in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I was speaking up there to a senior adult group. That night, the Cardinals were playing. McGuire had 61. I sensed in my spirit <laughs> that he was going to break the record. I just sensed it. So I cut my program short. I took the full honorarium, but I cut my program short. 
and I feel bad about it. So I'm going to go a little longer tonight. But, uh... <laughs> and so I got to my hotel. And you need to know this about, uh, about us in ministry. We're like everybody else. We're, I, I, I put on my gym shorts. I put on my jersey that said the boys are back because I was raised a Dallas Cowboy. The, the boys are back. I've added with a magic marker, the boys want to be back. The boys need to be back. The boys need a young quarterback that won't drop the snap in a playoff game. Just kick me. Still irritates me when I think about it. But he's married now, and maybe his wife will say, Hold it! You know, you hold that one. But anyhow. <laughs> so anyhow, I, I just, you know, I mean, I was sitting there in my hotel room, and I'm, I've got a Diet Coke in my left hand because I care about my body. <laughs> I got a bucket of chicken right there in front of me. <laughs> I got a little Debbie Swiss roll cake in my right hand. I love Little Debbie's. 300 calories, 20 fat grams for a quarter. I'm talk we're talking stewardship, people. <laughs> I'm sitting there. All of a sudden, McGuire gets up. Big old arms. All of a sudden, boom! Ball goes over the left field fence. I mean, I, just, I lost it. I, just, I was lost. Listen, every man in this room has a little boy inside of him. Don't we, men? You know we do. We want to let it out sometime, but our wives are just like, you behave yourself. <laughs> I mean, even right now, some of you men, you want to sort of, you wanted to shout, and your wife's going, sit still, sit still. <laughs> I mean, ladies, I love y'all, but, you know, I, you know, I want to talk to Beth more about doing a little workbook on submission, but, uh, <laughs> you know, but. Look. These men are so trained, some of them are looking at me going, don't get her stirred up, don't get her stirred up. So, oh, so I mean, I'm just, you know, I'm so excited and I'm, I'm watching this game. And, and so, uh, so I, 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 you know, you know, when he hit that home run, I mean, I just, I'm about to lose it, you know. And so I get on the phone and I call my wife, my little Laurie, and uh, we didn't have caller ID at the time you know, back then, and, and so she just answered the phone, hello, hello, you know how y'all are, hello, when you don't know it's us, it's your real perky, hello, 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 and I go, hey, baby, big swan, hi, you know, I mean, could you fake it one time for Jesus, you know what I mean? I said, baby, I need to talk to my boys. And now, now some of y'all, hold on. I'm going to get, I'm going to get, I've got my Bible here. I'm getting there. <laughs> this is a long introduction. <laughs> now, if I'd have preached like this at Southwestern Seminary in preaching class, I'd have gotten an F. <laughs> but I made a lot of money doing it this way. So, uh... <laughs> And my pastor says it's fine because he wants the tithe. But anyhow, so uh, I'm getting there. I'm going to get there. I Just be patient. So I said, baby love, let me talk to my boys. This is a man thing. She said, honey, you called three times. They saw the home run. I said, baby, I know, but I need to talk to them now. It's a man thing. Honey, just wait till you get home, okay? When you get home, you can talk to them all about it. I said, baby, I want to talk to my boys now. This is a man thing. It's a timely thing, and I need to talk to them now. It's a man thing. And finally, I just said, I need you right now, baby, to submit. <laughs> and she did. One time in 32 years of marriage. Each boy got on a phone. And I said, boys, do y'all see the home run? And they, these young people, they, 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 they mumble. Son, y'all mumble. You, you young guys, y'all mumble. You, you, have you noticed that? They mumble. I said, did you see the home run? He said, I saw it, dude. I don't want to pay, pay Jackson now. Huh? 
He jacked it out. He, he jacked it out. Home run. I said, what's up, dude? He jacked it out. Look, that young man over there, he's going, I got you the first time, man. I'm, <laughs> you know, when I'm at churches, I go right up to the young people on Sunday morning before I preach. I, just, I mean, I'm not intimidated by them. I go, hey, how y'all doing? Y'all doing all right? Doing good? And they go, hum a chum a hum a chum a chum a. I just go right back in. Hey, you much of my haunt you? They look at me and go. <laughs> I guess I spoke in a tongue. I don't know. Uh, I said, "You see the home run? I saw it there. Dusty's my youngest. He's ADD like me." I said, "Dusty, did you see?" He said, "Saw the replay. You saw the replay. I called you three times, son, to tell you to watch." I said, "Saw the replay." Boy, I needed a riddling right then real bad. <laughs> and then I said these words. Are y'all listening to me, boys? And they both said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Still, yes, sir. I don't know if it's a southern thing or whatever, but it's in our, still, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And then I said these words. You'll never see this record broken. My lifetime or your lifetime, son. Say it to me. We ain't never gonna see that record broken. My lifetime or your lifetime. I said, that's history, son. It's what they'll be teaching in your school. Say it to me, son. That's history, that's what they'll be teaching in the school. Don't you forget it as long as you have breath in your body. Say it to me. I ain't gonna forget as long as I'm with mama. <laughs> then I hung up. The Lord said, Swan, look at Joshua chapter 1. I said, Lord, I know what Joshua 1 is. I'm a, I was a pastor for 20 something years, good night, seminary trained and everything. The ball game's on. <laughs> I mean, this is history, people. This is history. He said, look at Joshua 1. I went, oh, Lord. He said, don't get cocky with me. Look at Joshua 1. Now, some of y'all are wondering, now, did he say Joshua 1? That morning, my quiet time had been Joshua 1, okay? And, and let me tell you, if you've had a good quiet time, you often remember it later in the day, don't you? And let, let's be honest. If you didn't have a real good quiet time, you, sometimes you forget about what it was, don't you? I know I'm guilty. But I'd had a good one. And so later that evening, it came back on me. And he said, and you know, the word, how, however many times we read this word, God can get an angle on you with the word. You know, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God lasts forever. And it's sharper than any two-edged sword. He can do his handy work. I mean, he, he's, uh, he, he's awesome. He said, look at verse 2, Swan. I said, well, Lord, I know what it says. I said, we're going to miss the ball game. This is history. I mean, remember what happened when McGuire hit that home run? He, when he came around to home plate, his son ran out there and jumped up into his arms. Does anybody remember that? I, I can still remember running and jumping up into my dad's arms. My dad was a printer. He, he, he printed all the insurance policies for the state of Texas. He wore gray dicky pants and gray dicky shirt, and he always smelled like ink. And he's 6'2", six, 220, six, a big man, and I'd run and jump into his arms. Remember how he, he'd hold me up, and he'd set me on, uh, on a picnic table, and I'd look at him eyeball to eyeball. I'd say, we're the same size, Dad. We're the same size, you know. Remember how you do. And then he, then, then he went over to Roger Maris's family who were on first base side and went over there and hugged them. Do you remember that? And then they brought out a 62 Red Corvette. Symbolic of the 62 home runs. And they stopped the game, and he just rode around in that 62 red Corvette. And remember the guy that caught the ball? He was going to give it back. What an idiot. <laughs> you sell it and tithe it to the church. <laughs> I mean, you laymen kill me sometimes. I mean, what? it was awesome. And then the Lord, right, right then, goes, look at verse 2. I went, okay, we're going to miss everything. Well, look at verse 2. I missed the history. Moses, my servant, is dead. I said, Lord, I think we all know that Moses died. <laughs> well, do y'all ever get irritated? 
I mean, with the Lord. I mean, this was big. And, and so he said, read it again. I went, okay. Moses, my servant, is dead. Then I, I knew what he was doing. He got an angle on me. He said, can you imagine how it must have felt for Joshua to take over from Moses? That's tough, isn't it? Everyone in here has a Moses, don't you? And he said, Dennis, how do you think your boys feel following you? Because you're always talking about those were the days and those were the days and blah, 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 blah. And, and yeah, you had maybe a little success. I mean, well, Lord, I mean, I ain't bragging. I just, you know, stating the fact. I mean, when I was in high school, I had a little six-pack, a little six-pack in my tummy. Now I got two kegs. But uh, I wear black. It makes you look thinner. But... Uh, I played football in Austin, Texas, Reagan High School. We were state champs, 67, 68, and 70. We were also national high school football champions, 67, 68, and 70. 68 and 70, we beat Odessa Permian, who they made, you know, a TV show Friday Night Lights. I took my boys to that movie. I said, boys, I'm going to show you the Friday Night Lights. These are the boys that we whooped two times. We just celebrated our 40th reunion last December, our football team for the 70 championship. And, and I wore my state championship ring and has my national championship around it. I, I'd let my daddy, uh, Floyd Leon, wear it for 40 years. I let him have it out of high school. And he wore but my dad has Alzheimer's. And my dad can't remember three minutes ago. He knows mom, he knows us, but... And mama was afraid he'd lose it, so... At last December, for the reunion, she gave it back to me, and I'm wearing it. I don't know if it's cool or not to wear it, but I'm wearing it. <laughs> State change. National high school change. I still got it, don't I? <laughs> So anyhow, the Lord said, you, you do all that to your boys. I mean, how do you think they feel? Well, you know, when I ask my boys, I always say, now, boys, listen, you've got to be your own man. I want you to do it. You be you. You don't need to be your daddy. You just be you. And they go, well, I don't want to be you. I'm going to be me. I don't want to be you. Well, all right, good. But, but the reality is, you know, you know who my Moses is? Floyd Swanberg. My dad's an awesome man. My dad's a sharecropper. My dad's a, a working man. My dad's had both elbows replaced, both knees replaced. Why? Because he's a worker. We're working people. Our people are work. We're not white collar. We're not blue collar. We're more ring around the collar. Uh, you know, I mean, we, we ate spam uh, growing up. We, we love spam. Uh, low fat spam. Nasty. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we, ate v we ate Vienna sausages that had the petroleum jelly all around. We, 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 put, we ate potted meat. Quit calling it, you, you wealthy people, quit calling it sandwich spread. It's potted meat. Every animal that God ever made is in that potted meat. I, t I probably shouldn't do this. My wife ain't here. She'd get on me. But I'm going to tell you, I, c I come across things real quick just to help people. If you take some wheat bread, put some potted meat on there, and fig preserves on top of it, you will never, ever need orange metamucil again. I promise. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so... But anyhow, and, but you know what the reality is? It is hard for your kids. It's hard for me with my dad. My dad's a good man. You know, I never heard my dad cuss. My dad was in the 36th Infantry Division, T. Patch of Texas, 21 years. He, my dad's a man's man. Uh, he's just a hero to me. And uh, I love my daddy, Floyd Leon Swamber. I, 
He lets me call him Floyd Leon in my stories, but I never called him Floyd Leon. I did, I did one time. I mean, if I'd ever done it again, I'd be with Jesus. <laughs> you know, but, but he lets me use Floyd Leon in his stories. And I love my daddy. You know, he does his memory and all that. It's just a tough thing. He still goes to church. Mom, they still go. And everybody's very sensitive to my mom and my dad. But, you know, some... Some people may have the tendency to say, you know, that's not my dad anymore. He's not the same anymore. That's just not my dad. That's, uh, dad sort of left us. Well, let me tell you something. That is my dad. That is my dad. And uh, he may not remember who I am, but I know who he is. And I love my daddy. And... Uh, so I imagine that it's tough on my boys to some degree. You know, my boys have had, had bumps in the road. Have, have your kids ever had any bumps in the road? I mean, are your children perfect, you know? <laughs> I, I, know I know heartache. I know, I know tears. I know that, 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 that just that knot in your, in your, in your stomach. But... You know, I, I know it. I've been there. And uh, it's not fun, is it? And, but they got to find their way. And I can't, I can't find their way for them. I can't fix it. But nevertheless, the Lord said, Swan, you know, be sensitive to your boys. At least be sensitive. Can you imagine how Joshua must have felt? I mean, how do you follow Moses? Moses. I mean, just the name. Moses. And, and, and remember, he was born, they put him in that basket. I mean, th those baskets cost money now, people. <laughs> my, buy, my wife buys them from Loggenberry, Log, Log, Loggenheimer, Log, something, Log, you know, whatever. I asked her one day, I said, are we going on a picnic? Because they're everywhere in our house. And, and you know what she said? Don't start with me. I thought, did that come out of a workbook? But anyhow, uh, <laughs> then he goes and he lives with Pharaoh. I mean, how do you top that? If someone else has on their resume, they live with Pharaoh, they get the job, not you. How do you compete? How does jo Poor old Joshua, how do you follow Moses? And then he, then he kills a man and, uh, you know, does a Jerry Springer show. Then he comes down to the land of Midian. He had everything, and now he doesn't have everything. He's, he's lost it all. He, he had it, and he's failed. Have you ever failed? Have you ever failed? Well, so what? We've all failed. None of us here are perfect. Have your kids failed? Has your loved one failed? Has your spouse failed? We all fail. And he's sitting there at that watering hole. He had it all, and he's lost it all, and he's wondering, what am I going to do? How do I ever find God's will again? And, and we've all been there, and, and you wonder, what do I do? And, and, and all of a sudden, here comes Jethro's daughters, and they're coming to get water, and these nomads would come and give them a hassle and, and, and maybe steal the water from them after they'd drawn the water. I don't know what all they were doing. But, but Moses sort of stood up like a John Wayne and said, leave them alone. And don't you mess with them or you'll mess with me. Yo, and they backed off and left. The girls got home early, and the dad said, how'd y'all get home early? Well, Daddy, there's this guy, and he stuttered, but he's a hunk, you know. <laughs> well, why don't you bring him home? Maybe he'll marry one of y'all. Bring him home for supper. So they did bring him home for supper. And sure enough, he married one. And all of a sudden, he gets a job again. And all of a sudden, he's, he started back in the will of God. How did it happen? Real quick, look, this a whole other sermon. He acted on that which was at hand. Just sitting there wondering, what is he going to do? He acted on that which was at hand. Just helped those girls. He got up and helped the girls. And all of a sudden, it started him back on track to get back to where he needed to be. And then he's out there in, his, in the pasture, and all of a sudden, what happens? A burning bush. 
Oh, if someone has a burning bush, they definitely get the job, not you. I mean, you cannot top a burning bush. You know, today, if someone had a burning bush experience, you know what we would do? We'd, we'd write a book, Six Steps, How to Have a Burning Bush Experience in Your Life. Did you ever think that burning bush was for Moses and nobody else? You know, God has something for you. God has something for me. God has, he has something for you and for you. Why do we always want to try to duplicate what he does for someone else? Why don't you just let him speak to you if it's a still, small voice? God loves you. Can, you, can we get that in our head? He said, Joshua, listen, just as I was with Moses, I'll be with you. God is no respecter of persons. He loves you as much as he loves me. He loves me as much as he loves you. He loves you as much as he loves Joshua. He loves you. He's crazy about you. You know, I just wish our kids could understand how much we love them sometimes. But it, it, they just, they, they, they can't grasp it yet. You know, I mean, if they, when they have kids, they'll know. There's been those times with my boys where even those heartache times where you get the phone call. And you have to learn that you have to quit being the enabler. And that you can't fix it. And that they have to find their way and you have to wait. And sometimes you have to let them hit bottom until they say, I am helpless. But don't we all have to come to that point where we say, I am helpless. And some of you moms and dads, can I talk to moms and dads right now, grandmas and grandpas, you know, listen. Don't be too hard on yourself. I mean, I've been hard on myself, and, and, and rightly so. You know, I try to evaluate you know, what I did, what I didn't do right, and what I should have done more of. Maybe I shouldn't have been gone so much. Maybe I shouldn't have, you know, be on the road so much. And, you know, you can, you can find plenty of, of fodder, of fuel to beat yourself up with. But remember this, Adam and Eve had a perfect father, and they had a perfect world, but they had a mind of their own. And your kids have a mind of their own. And we need to remember that. He said, Joshua, just as I was with Moses, I'll be with you. Listen, there are more firsts to come in your life and my life because of God's love for us. He goes on to say, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I love that verse. You read it again in Hebrews 13, 5. I'll never leave you nor forsake you as a quote of Jesus. And I've, I love that verse. I majored in Greek and religion at Baylor University. I'm not a scholar. I'm not like Dr. Dave, David Jeremiah. I'm not a scholar, but I've, 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 I majored in it. <laughs> like an idiot. But anyhow, I majored in it. <laughs> but one thing I learned in that little verse, there's five negatives. And, you, and with the help of Billy Graham, I, let me explain. In, in, in the English, we just say, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. We translate two negatives, but you could actually do five. You could call it a synergistic, compounded negative. I'll never, never, no never, leave you nor forsake you. I'll never turn my back on you. I'll never ignore you. I'm the hound of heaven. I'm tracking you down not to hurt you, but to bless you because I love you. He loves you. You know, there's times, and there have been times, when I had to walk away and leave my boys in a condition and a place that I didn't want to leave them. And that was hard. As an earthly father. But I knew our heavenly father said, I'll never, never, no never, leave you, nor forsake you. I'll never turn my back on you. I'll never ignore you. I am closer than your very breath. I am in you. You know, some things can't be worked out except with your loved ones and him and him alone. I can't make anybody happy. I can make you laugh. I can make you happy for a moment. But I can't make you joyful in your heart. That's your choice, whether or not you're going to be happy or not. 
whether you choose joy or not, whether you enjoy the joy of your salvation, whether you enjoy a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, that, that's up to you. I cannot force that upon you. And then he said to, to Joshua, be strong and courageous, be strong and courageous, be strong and courageous. I love that. It was an encouragement to him to say, go and live life and love it. Why not love it? Seize it. Enjoy it. And quit letting someone else rob you of that joy. Some of you have laughed a little bit tonight, maybe for the first time in a long time, no telling what's been going on in your life, and you finally laughed a little bit. You, you, you had a little respite. You know, the Bible says there's a time for tears and a time for laughter, and you've laughed maybe a little bit. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. And if your bones dry up, then they can get brittle and they can break. And if they break, then you've got to take Beneva. <laughs> Sally Fields takes Beneva. <laughs> Bone density. I'll tell you what I do for my bone density. Bluebell ice cream, that's what I do. <laughs> you can't make anybody happy, but I'll tell you what we can do. You can be happy. You can have joy. And you need to quit. You need to get off this guilt thing. You, you need to quit saying, I'm going to hide. I'm going to stay at home. I'm not going to go out. I'm not going to go and do because, you know, I, I, my, my son's gotten into this or my daughter's gotten into this or I, I haven't told anybody in my Sunday school class that my, my son and daughter are splitting. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're divorcing. I hadn't told them that my, my child's coming out of the closet or this is that or, or whatever the issue may be or uh, la di da, la di da, la di da. And you want to just sort of withdraw. My friend, you you don't withdraw, you live. You live. You live in Christ Jesus. You live. What was it for Moses? He's the I am. The I am is with me. The I am sent me. What was the answer for, for Joshua? He, he said, it's for me. We forget that sometimes. We, we think, me and my house, we, we, we think about the house almost too quickly. We need to have a pause there. As for me and my house, if they will. But as for me, I'm going to serve the Lord, and I'm going to enjoy the Lord. And, and I tell senior adults, especially when they're on these trips and everything, I said, go and enjoy yourself. Quit staying home. Go out and live life. The best witness for your child is to see that you genuinely know the Lord and you love the Lord and you're happy in the Lord. Let them see that the, that the joy of the Lord is your strength. Quit trying to just be, oh, well, they're not. Well, listen, people that have lived a while, they know because they've got kids. They've got nephews and nieces. You get a little bit older and we all realize that grace is very needful in all of our lives best thing for them to see is that you're not just bailing them out all the time, that you're just not going to cater to them all the time, but that you're going to have a holy boldness to say, well, I hope, hope things work out for you. I love, we love you now. Good luck to you. And Lord be with you. We're going to Branson. And you know what? I, let me say this. And I know, I know my time. I've got to wrap it up. They don't need all your money. Hello? They don't, they don't need all your money. I'll tell you what they're going to do with it. They're going to spend it. You know, what, you, know what, you know what they ought to do? They ought to open up your safety deposit box and find a bunch of cassette tapes of Dr. Jeremiah's sermons and DVDs and books and, you know... Let them write a book, What in the World Happened to My Inheritance? You know, let them write something. Because their joy is going to have to be found in Him, not in you, not in me, not in this world, not in things, but in Him and Him alone. So be strong and courageous to live life. And if they come around, they come around. If they don't come around, they don't come around. Okay? Well, I got to wrap this thing up.
I got to wrap it up. I'm wrapping it up. Yep. We'll, I'll edit it down. I'll edit it down. <laughs> I love that man. I prompted him before the service. <laughs> I want to encourage you. You got one life. I want to encourage you to go for it. Live it with all that you have. And quit trying to fix everything. And who am I saying that for? I'm saying it for me. Because I want to fix it. I want to fix it. Because you see, I really believe that if they'll let me, I could fix it. But who wants to live my life? They need to live their life. And if I'm trying to live their life, I'm not living my life. It's not that I'm not concerned about them and that I don't love them and that I don't want to help them and encourage them because I'm commanded to do that, Hebrews 10, 25. But the word that he told Joshua, he said, Joshua, you be strong and courageous. I can make that happen. And when we live that life, there is room for laughter. You say, well, when? Well, I guarantee you one time that old Joshua was laughed when he got with all of his buddies and, you know, they looked back and went, hey, remember that time we went around Jer Jericho and we just marched around there and we blew them horns and just <laughs> everything went down? <laughs> Those guys didn't know what happened. You remember that? Remember Harley? He tried to blow the horn and got spit all over in it. <laughs> I mean, do you, don't you think something like that happened? Or do you just think they were characters that went, Hello, how are you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> we blew our horn. I mean, they were blowing a horn. And <laughs> And they had good times reminiscing about that. And the joy of the Lord was in their place. May that be the reality for all of us. So I want to ask you, are you going to let there be more first in your life? Are you going to enjoy life? Are you going to live in such a fashion that you don't draw such attention to yourself? I, I need to work better, not a drawing for my boys to look what I've been through or what I'm doing, but to look unto him, the one that can make it all happen. Because I'm an eight-track guy in an iPod world. <laughs> and old Daniel here, he don't even know what eight-track is right here. <laughs> I need to encourage them to be all that God wants them to be. And when we do that, we've done good. God bless you, and thank you for letting me be with you tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, amen. I know that you enjoyed Brother Dennis's video on loving and living life to the fullest. It made me think of John 10.10 10, where Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Amen right there. Well, it's been good being with you this evening. Please help us get out the word about the great things the Lord is doing through our live ministry. And by telling your friends and family about us and, and maybe even sharing our videos on your own timeline. Thanks again for tuning in and we'll look forward to seeing you online Wednesday evening at 7 at Temple Free Will Baptist Church where the sun is always shining.